Thank you and good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone and thank you very much for first of all attending this conference and for attending my talk. Now I'm in a little bit of a difficult situation here because I'm the last one to present. So you spend the last couple of days to learn about Angular. There were lots of great talks, lots of you know great technical content. So now I need to you know give the same value to you. So hopefully uh, I'll make that possible. So the title of this talk is Performant Angular Applications. And I have to admit that the reason why this talk is longer than than the usual as was mentioned is because I normally give this sort of presentation as a workshop, usually in three or four hours. Um, but I try to condense down the essence of that workshop. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how to create performant Angular applications throughout this talk. We're going to go through you know, uh, various bits and pieces that would have either negative or positive effects on your Angular app. And then I'm going to show you two applications, which are the applications that we would be working on uh, if, if this was a workshop. Um, and compare the performance uh, values from them. And you're going to get access to both of those applications, of course. So later on this session, you can go to that GitHub page where I host these applications, and you can take a look at the source code in your, in your own time. And of course, always contact me and ask me questions about stuff. So hello, <laughs> my name is Tamash. Um, I work at a company called Cloudinary, and I work uh, as a developer evangelist over there. Uh, I also have my own training business, which is called Full Stack Training, and I happen to be a Google developer expert in web technologies. So that's pretty much about me. Um, if you ever have any questions about you know stuff that I talk about here or you know anything that I discuss throughout this this particular session, uh, you see the little handle right on this side on the top. Uh, feel free to, to add me. My DMs are open, so I'm more than happy to, to answer your questions and help you out uh, the best that I can. So I have a couple of slides, as I said, about 10, 12 slides just to talk about the very basics of web performance and performance and why it's why it's really important. And then we're going to jump into my code editor. We're going to take a look at code. And we're going to see how the two applications that I created uh, perform. So first of all, you know, the big question, what is web performance? So web performance is, is really trying to answer how fast a particular website is. But there are a lot of things that we need to take into consideration. And one thing that I don't think is, is mentioned anywhere in this presentation, but the key thing is that web performance is also perceptual. So something can be fast for me, but it could be slow for you. And something could be very slow for me, but you would say, well, that's a, that actually was really fast. So you know, it's always going to be dependent on uh, how people perceive load times. But essentially, when we talk about web performance, we try to measure how fast a website loads on various devices, on a desktop, or a tablet, or a mobile phone, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot of factors that we need to take into consideration, things like you know, page speed and page speed indexes. So that's going to be driven by the actual architecture and the code that you used to create that application. Then you also have things like network connection, for example, right? So the network connection is going to depend on whether you use a desktop with a wired connection or whether you are on a train using a mobile, right? So you need to remember these things as well. Also, the entire infrastructure of the application. Are you hosting your application on one of the you know, CDM providers, or are you hosting your website within your company on your own servers? That's going to matter when it comes to, to uh, web performance. And the reason why I need to think about web performance is because your ultimate goal is to try to retain your users, right? You try to engage with your users, you try to provide your services, your website, you know, your products, if it's an e-commerce site, to your end users as fast as possible, and you want to make sure that you, for example, have increased sales if you're talking about an e-commerce website, right? The ultimate goal is that you want to show your products to them and you want to sell those products. Now, if those products will not load or people will find that your site is sluggish, they're going to leave, right? That, that's a fact. Um, I collected some interesting statistics uh, 
from the web. So that's the next couple of uh, slides. And I'm just going to whiz through this because you can do uh, your research on your own. But there were some very interesting things that I learned while I was doing this research. And interestingly enough, as of 2017, 2G was still the most used mobile network. That has, of course, now changed, which I think is now 3G. But even in 2017, at least in the places where I used to live, I was on 3G and then almost you know, 4G were introduced in 2017 in places. So thinking about that, you know, the place where you live and the place where you develop your code and, and you know, it may represent reality. That's what I'm trying to say here, right? You need to remember that there could be people who would be using your product, who would be using your website, who would be accessing your website from places that you may not have considered, right? And that is likely to be the majority of your users. So you can't assume that everyone is going to be on a 4G or even a 5G connection or a fast internet connection, and you can't assume and you should not assume that they will have the latest mobile devices or the fastest computers, right? So remember this when you do your tests. Um, again, as I said, some statistics from uh, from various um, uh, providers. I think this statistic appeared on Google's website. Um, so things like you know the BBC, which is in this case the British Broadcasting Company, they lost about ten percent of the users for every additional second that their site to, to load, right? So basically for every second, they use 10% of the users. And the BBC is one of the most visited websites in the UK. Therefore, we're talking about a very big proportion of users that would just leave the site because they won't wait for a page to, to load. And you know, if we're talking about the uh, a news outlet, which is BBC is, and they have lots of other websites, of course, you can read that you know, news article on any other uh, uh, domain, right? So you could go to another newspaper to read that. So what, you know, you're going to be losing uh, users. And again, uh, stuff from Google, which you can find under the Web Fundamentals uh, page. Uh, you know, they talk about the user perception, so how, uh, how the page load time is going to affect your user behaviors. Okay, so there are various studies with various numbers. Uh, take a look at these. There's a link uh, if you want to read more about this, as well, of course. Um, OK, that's, again, statistics about you know, how lots of people, uh, you know, there are 500 million mobile users in 2020 in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's a lot of customers that you have access to, or potential customers or potential visitors that you have access to. Um, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, they may not have the fastest internet. So again, just you know, think about your user base. That's, that's the bottom line. I'm going to uh, uh, move on from this, because I think you, you get the idea. Uh, another thing that you need to remember that when it comes to web performance, and when it comes to testing your, your performance metrics, it has to be an iterative process. So this, the sort of life cycle of, of this is that you test, you, know, you, you test how fast your, your web page is loaded, you use Lighthouse, you use the Web Vital metrics, you measure these, you record them, because it is also essential that you record these values, and then maybe a month later, you come back, you do some changes to your site, and you test again, you measure again, you record it. Right? And in this way, you will have comparable metrics from which you can deduce whether your site performance has increased or has decreased. And here's a quote from, or a tweet from, from Adi Osmani, who's one of the, uh, I think he's a developer evangelist manager at Google. Um, he said earlier this year that if you want a fast site, then you have to test on slow hardware regularly, okay? And essentially that one sentence sums up what I was talking to you uh, earlier. So what is your ultimate goal? So your ultimate goal is to provide the best user experience, regardless of what device and what network connections your users are having. Okay. So in other words, and you can quote me on this, you should not have or you should not create a negative user experience to allow people to visit your site. In other words, what I'm saying here is that your goal 
should not be to remove features or to you know display less information for users just to enhance the page load speed for example right even if someone is visiting your website on a slower connection you should still do your best to provide the same functionality and the, uh, some some good experience for them okay because that will also matter and we're going to talk about this uh, a bit more in detail okay so how would you do that so i, I kind of separate this into two parts you have to work on backend components and you have to take a look at the front end components as well, right? Depending on whether you're just a front end developer or you're this you know, full stack developer or you, you have access to the backend code, there are things that you can do at the backend, you know, enable compression, you know, GZ, Brotly, et cetera. Use HTTP2 or you know, the latest HTTP3 if you can. And also do appropriate media management. And by media management, I mean management of images and videos, right? So that's, that's kind of on the back end. But, you know, he, we talk about Angular, so that's the front end bit, and that's where you need to concentrate on things like, you know, lazy loading. And on the lazy loading, I actually mean two things. It's not just lazy loading of your um, components, it's also lazy loading any images that you may have or, or you know, any other visual asset that you may have on a particular page. So it's, it's actually covering two things. Uh, you know, minification, is something that you can do. Uh, also, removing and other minification that's kind of, again, a subcategory, try to remove unused code um, from, your, uh, from your application. I'm going to show you a tool that allows you to do this, uh, especially uh, very useful for Angular, where you can remove sort of modules that you, you know, you may have tested something in your app and you just forgot that you have an import statement somewhere. That you're not using and install the package and then there's this tool that tells you hey you have this particular package but nothing's using that so you can just remove that uh, also stuff like preloading so that's not necessarily related to angular you can just you know use the preload uh, attribute on on anything but that helps with uh, an angular application for example preloading your fonts right that's not necessarily related to angular but it will be part of your web application as well. And of course, with this minification and, and module removal, uh, you kind of help your bundle size as well. So it's very important to think about how large your, your bundle is. And of course, lazy loading your, your components and, and creating feature modules in Angular will also help you with the bundle size management. Um, one Key bit here is, and, and I always forget to add that stuff to, to, to my slides, but it's very important. So if you take a look at the, the web, the overall web, the, the most amount of data is, you know, that, that you use up by, by loading up a site is images or, or media assets, images and videos, right? That's you know, many, many kilobytes, if not megabytes. After that, you have the JavaScript bundles, and after that, you have the CSS and the HTML and the rest that you need to load up the web page. So by far, the biggest proportion of an entire web page that gets loaded by your browser is going to be images, especially if you think about an e-commerce website or a news outlet where the essence of these pages is that they display media for you. They display you visual content, right? So, uh, and, and someone asked me before on the workshop, like, why do you have that cat next to GIFs? And I was like, you know, cat GIFs. But th that's, that's why I have that in, in, um, in parentheses <laughs> right there. So, you know, images help with, you know, better storytelling. Uh, it gives you very powerful visual content. It, it kind of helps you to sell a product on an e-commerce website. Um, so with the visual uh, content, you really can take your website to the next level, right? It's going to be beautiful, it's going to be nice and very, you know, animations and videos and content, et cetera, et cetera. But therein lies the problem, right? Because as I said, websites have a large number of images and a large number of videos, and this can cause a negative impact on your performance. Whether you use an Angular application or whether you don't use an Angular application, still you need to remember that there's lots of image and video formats out there. There's lots of stuff that unfortunately developers do incorrectly today. And I'm going to talk about that as well when I'm going to present you the application. Uh, things like you know, trying to 
manipulate images by CSS, uh, and they don't realize that the browser would still download a two megabyte image, which then they shrink down to 200 by 200 pixels. That's not the right way to do stuff. Um, lazy loading, I, I mentioned. So you have you know Angular uh, feature module that you can lazy load. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, how and and why that matters. Um, and also you can do lazy loading for images. So why would you load images on a particular page in a gallery of images if the images are not visible, right? So you can apply what is called lazy loading. And lazy loading is actually getting native support on the web. So I think the latest couple of versions of Chrome automatically support lazy loading. Uh, we're going to talk about that. And of course, as I said, we're going to talk about how to lazy load uh, modules and feature modules and components using Angular. Key takeaways, doesn't matter. And let's talk about the application, right? We're going to dive in and, and look at code now. So as I said, I have two demo applications, right? It's exactly the same app. One is going to behave terribly. The other one is going to be really, really, really fast. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to launch the first one, we're going to take a look at the you know, Lighthouse score, we're going to take a look at what's happening in the app, I'm going to point out a few things for you, and then we're going to jump into the other app, which is the final version of this application, which is really fast, and we're going to go through the same stuff. We're going to run Lighthouse, uh, we're going to see how well uh, the score, or how the score has changed, if it has changed, hopefully it will, uh, and I'm going to point out a few uh, bits and pieces for you, and then uh, I think that's going to actually wrap up this, this session as well. As I said, normally this is part of a three, four hour workshop. I got the time that I got, which is again, very generous. So thank you for that. Um, but I'll try my best to, to walk you through at least the thought process behind how I went from the application that performs terribly to an application that kind of works uh, uh, better. Uh, and in light of that, we're going to take a look at how to laser load components or, or create feature modules in Angular. We're going to take a look at images and how to laser load those, how to do front preloading, uh, how to uh, eliminate unneeded JavaScript and CSS from, from the app, or at least I'm going to show you how you can get started with that using Chrome DevTools, um, and talk about you know, media assets as well uh, a little bit. So that being said, let me just change things around here a little bit and bring up my code editor. So hopefully the font size is good enough. And I'm going to do left-hand side that. And I'm going to open a new window for Chrome. And I'm going to put that to the right-hand side. Um, so I'm hoping that the font size here is large enough. So I'm just going to open uh, um, a, a file. Can anyone just in the um, StreamYard chat confirm to me whether that's whether you think this font size is legible or not? Hopefully it is. If it's not, I can make it larger. Fingers crossed. It's okay. Okay, no messages. I will then assume that this is okay. Right, so what I'm going to do, open up the terminal and do an ng. So actually, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to do an ng build prod. Okay, so let's say we finished building this particular application uh, and now we, you know, we tested it and now we think it's, it's ready to be, to be built. So I'm going to build it and I'm going to serve it uh, using the NPM module HTTP serve. And then we're going to open it in the browser and see um, what's going to happen with this particular app. OK, that takes a lot of time. But luckily, I've, I've done this before. So I'm not sure why that is taking such a long time. But what I'm going to do is uh, run the HTTP server, as I mentioned. So it's HTTP server this base. OK, so on localhost 8080, we have our running applications. Let's take a look at that. OK, so I don't know if you can see that loading bar, but something is loading. And voila, here is our wonderful application, right? which pretends to be a sports magazine. We have this 
front page, I can then click on article where I see um, a particular article about a sports event. So there's a video playing, there's some text, and there are lots of images in here. And then we have the about page as well. Okay, of course, everything on this page is made up. Um, but the one thing that I want you to, to realize is that when I first loaded the page, and if I just do a refresh, or actually what I will do, I'll go to about blank. So when I load the page, notice that for a couple of seconds, nothing is happening, right? So the page is loading and loading and loading, and then boom, we now have um, a, uh, a, a front page, essentially. So you can already feel that something is not quite right. And the first thing that you, know, you would want to do uh, when you create your application is, of course, open up your dev tools in Chrome, click on a lighthouse, and then generate a report. So basically, for those of you who are familiar with the tool, lighthouse um, basically runs through your application, and you can select a bunch of categories here, like performance and best practices and accessibility, uh, tell Lighthouse whether to run the test against a, a mobile or a desktop, and it's going to generate a report, and the report is going to contain uh, a performance score, and it's going to highlight you know, if you're doing stuff right, but it's also going to highlight if you're doing some stuff um, incorrectly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to generate this report, and we're going to take a look at uh, the report together now. So remember, I'm not running this against the ng-serve command. I'm running this against a proper HTTP server. And as you can see, best practice is 100, which is really great. But the performance score is 38. And according to this chart, anything between 0 to 49 is terrible. OK, so the performance here is terrible. 50 to 89 would be you know, orange, which is OK-ish. And then anything above 90 is green, which is probably the, the, the values that you should be aiming for, right? Not just an Angular project, any project should be between 90 to 100. Now, if you scroll down, we get quite a few, you know, red marks here, like largest content for paint, uh, time to interact with, total blocking time, et cetera, et cetera, which are, again, just metrics that Lighthouse is, is utilizing or tests that Lighthouse is utilizing to take a look at how well our application is performing. And largest content for paint takes 6.7 seconds, which is a long time, right? So the largest sort of block on this page takes six seconds to load, which is not the best, right? And if you take a look at the trace, even when the background loads for a long time, and probably you can't really see this, but for a long time, we have to wait before we get this actual uh, text box here. And then you have, you know, enable text co compressions. If you would do that, that would help. Preloading key requests would help. Serving images in next gen formats would work. And we have a lot of JavaScript and CSS that we could remove. And there's some additional things that we should probably take a look at. Now, one more test that I want to run, because this is the main page, right? But if I go to the article here, and in order to start a new Lighthouse test, so basically, when you do a lighthouse test that is going to be applicable to the page that you see so if i want to run a lighthouse test against the article here i need to rerun the report so i'm going to click on the plus icon and i'm going to just generate the report again to see how well this particular article is performing and it's not performing at all because um because thank you very but <laughs> trust me this page is is not going to perform uh, uh, that well. Consider, oops, considering that the main page um, was a very, very bad performance score. So, what's happening? Why? Why am I getting this uh, this performance thing? So, first of all, uh, I have to admit I've made some deliberate mistakes in this application. Or it's not really mistakes. Let me rephrase that. I've done some deliberate things in this application just to demonstrate to you what could happen if you, for example, don't do uh, feature modules and you don't load your modules lazily. So we, we have 
our Angular application, we have three components in here. We have about, article, and the home component. Of course, we have the routing here, which basically says, if you're on the root of the app, load the home component. If we are on the article path, load the article component. If you're on the about path, load the about component. Nothing special happening in here. But I can tell you that, or not tell you, but I'm going to ask you, why do you think the home component takes so much time to load? Because if I take a look at the home component, the, the, there's nothing in the TypeScript file, and the HTML, the template for this component, is just literally this white box here. So why does it still take four or five seconds for it to appear? And this is when we need to take a look at the network tab and just take a look at the JavaScript that gets loaded. But again, if you created this application, you would know uh, uh, what's happening. So if I just filter for the JavaScript files that get loaded, I notice that there's one single JavaScript bundle called main.js that gets loaded. So that's the entire application, which kind of tells me that the issue may not be with the whole component, but the issue may be somewhere else in a different component. And because we have one, we created our application in a way that we have one JavaScript file containing our entire Angular application, any sort of quirks and mistakes and you know free long load times in any other component will also affect the home component. And in fact, this is what's happening. So if I open the, the article component, and if I take a look at the TypeScript file, the, you know, the component code itself, and this is where I was kind of cheating, I have a Fibonacci number calculation, which will print the 40 second Fibonacci number to my console. But notice this is part of the article component. So you're probably wondering, what is wrong with you? Why did you do this? And the reason why I did this is because calculating, you know, mathematical calculations in JavaScript are blocking operations, right? So they block the JavaScript execution. And this is just purely to demonstrate that any sort of blocking operation in any other component will affect every other component that you have, right? Clearly, the article component is the one that has this heavy operation, yet if I load the home component, I am being affected by it, which is not good. Now, to overcome this, this is when you would apply feature modules and lazy loading of your modules, okay? Now, what I'll do, instead of you know, typing stuff here, I am going to open up my second editor right here which is our final application. I'm going to see how different this is when it comes to the module structure. So first of all, again, we have the about articles and home um, components. But if I open up my app routing module, you will see that it's slightly different than the, what we've seen before. So for the articles path, instead of just saying component articles, I have load children, which will then import articles slash articles dot module. And this is a promise-based import, so it's going to just load the articles module. So if I expand articles, you will see that articles is actually a feature module. So by creating a feature module, I am allowed to a lazy load that module. In other words, the article module is only going to be loaded when someone opens the articles root, which also means that any blocking operation that we have or, or any operation that takes a lot of time to execute or some time to execute in the articles component is not going to affect any other component that I have. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to fire up, I think I have a server file here, is that correct? Uh, so this is going to, again, assume I've done ng-build pro, and I'm just going to serve this up. And if I open a new tab, I go to localhost 8080, the home 
Oh wait, the other one's running, is it? Oh yeah, it's, it's fine. Sorry. So if, if I just refresh the home screen, you see it loads pretty much immediately, right? I don't need to wait for this for four or five seconds to, to complete. However, if I let me just double check this, the article component in here. Still, this what I'm going to demonstrate to you that still, if I click on the article, that component is going to take some time to load, of course. But at least my other components are not going to be affected by this particular change. Now, if you sort of find a particular component that takes a lot of time to execute, you will need to do some additional digging to figure out, you know, maybe it's an HTTP request that doesn't uh, complete in, in the right time uh, or, or the time that you want, or there's some other issue, but you can at least avoid slowing down your entire application because of one single component. Okay, so this is, uh, if you want to read more about this, this is feature modules in Angular and then lazy load. Um, and, and it's very important that you take a look at lazy loading of modules because you know if you come maybe from a React or a Vue background, those two sort of frameworks and libraries allow you to lazy load components. In Angular, you can't lazy load a component; you need to lazy load an entire module, which you achieve by uh, feature modules. Okay, so I've done the ng build, and I'm just going to serve this up. What I'm going to demonstrate to you now using the network panel. First of all, if I go to if I go here, I now have a main file again, but it's a lot uh, smaller than, than before. And if I click on article, notice that this is the particular path that has that Fibonacci number, and it takes some time to load, right? It still takes the you know, couple of seconds. Uh, that we experienced before. And also notice a new JavaScript file also got loaded with the name of 4.hash.js, which indicates that this is now the code for this particular module. Okay, and if I click on the about part, then, oh yeah, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm not busy loading that, so that wouldn't be a new file uh, loaded for that. Okay, but for every lazy loaded module, the needed JavaScript would be loaded only when you access that, that particular um, path. Right, so that's feature modules lazy loading in, in, in Angular. A couple of um, uh, tidbits for you inside angular.json. You can do quite a few interesting things. So first of all, in my sort of slow application, Let's say that you know I, I did browser animations and the HTTP uh, uh, client module. Here's maybe I was making an HTTP request. I was you know adding some feature, and let's imagine that this is a much larger application, and you can't really you know track what you've done, and maybe you left these two things in here, but clearly my application is not using any of these. So how can you uh, uh, trace that? So you can do two things. First of all, you can go into your angular.json file, and in here, you can find a particular setting which is uh, under, where am I? So it's under the, the projects, the base project, that's the name of my project, and you can take a look at um, named chunks and source map, I believe. Let me just check. I, I'm not sure what the default values for those are, because I'm not sure if I've actually modified this, but let me compare this with other example here. Yeah, so source map, I think, defaults to false, and the name chunks also defaults to false. If you change those to true, then you can essentially run um, uh, a tool which is called source map explorer, uh, let me just do it right here. So it's called Source Map Explorer. 
First Web Explorer is an NPM project, so you can install it globally in your system, like I've done so, via NPM install or Yarn Add, uh, you know, depending on what you're using. And then using this source map explorer, what you can do, you can point it to your, oops, you can point it to your JavaScript bundle. So that's uh, this here. Source, sorry, come back to source, come on, source map, explorer, this. Where did my, oh, sorry, you need to point it against the JavaScript file. So source, source map, explorer, and then you point it to your, uh, your main JavaScript bundle file. And what this is going to do, is open up an HTML page for you, which it did on a different screen for me. So let me bring it over right here. It's going to open up this file. It's pretty tiny, but basically what you see here, I'm trying to zoom in a little bit. What you will see is basically all the JavaScript files and all the modules that make up your main JavaScript file. And because you've enabled these two settings in Angular, the JSON source map and main chunks, you can very easily trace down the uh, the JavaScript uh, uh, package content, okay? And using this, um, and I don't think I've run this, I have to rerun the ng build for this. Looking at this, you will you would find things like, you know, the HTTP module, you would find the, the, um, uh, the browser animations module in here. Just looking at this, you will see that, okay, so my overall bundle is 210 kilobytes, that's 100% of that. And what are the sort of components that contribute to those 210 kilobytes? And you will see things here like, um, um, folder. so you would see things like here, like the HTTP module would take up, I don't know, 50 kilobytes, right? And at this point, you can just think about, oh, am I actually using that, you know, the HTTP modules? Am I actually using the browser animations, which is another 30 kilobytes? And then you can go back to your application, and you can remove all these dependencies, and therefore, if you rerun this tool again, the size of your overall bundle will go down. All right? So we can, we're going to do this kind of reverse now, because if you look at this, we have 210 kilobytes. There's no HTTP module. There's no browser animations module, uh, I just re-enabled those in my app module file, and I'm just rerunning a production build of this app, and then we're going to point Source Map Explorer uh, to our main bundle and see if it will uh, catch the additionally added modules, which are not actually used by my uh, project. So I'm going to go back to this base. And I'm going to say source map explorer uh, main JS. Again, I need to bring this over here. And now things look different, right? So it's, it's almost 100 kilobytes more because now I got, you know, browser.js and animations, which is 64 kilobytes. And I also get, um, probably because I zoom, it's not visible, but I'm also, oh, no, it's here, sorry. I'm also getting HTTP.js, which is another 15 kilobytes. So, you know, I look at this now, I'm like, oh, am I actually using animations? No, I can remove that, therefore reducing my whole bundle size with 64 kilobytes. Okay, just an interesting tool. Uh, feel free to, to test this out. As I said, the tool is called Source Map Explorer. It is a, a CLI tool installable by NPM or yeah. Right, um, I'm going to run out of time, so let me switch gears and talk about um, some, some other bits in this application. Namely, the article. So in here, I have a video that actually is being played and I have a bunch of images. If I look at all the media uh, or all the files that got loaded, 
all these images and, and everything is loaded. And if I take a look at the, I'm not sure whether this is really visible for you, but basically what we have here is the amount of data that got transferred for this particular page. So 22 requests, 37.7 megabytes. That's like, what? Finished in 6.4 seconds. Again, I've done some very terrible things here deliberately. First of all, there are seven images in this carousel uh, for this gallery. All seven images get loaded, and these images are not optimized. Each and every single image, as you can see, is about 2.5 megabytes or 1.1 megabyte. I'm just using CSS to shrink down the image. Furthermore, this animation here, that's actually a, a GIF. Okay, that's like a, a 10, 15 second gift, which contributes many, many megabytes um, on this page. To be precise, 18 megabytes. Right? That's not really good. Um, take a look at this profile image as well. That profile image is 1.4 megabytes in size, right? But if you take a look at this, and I'm not sure if I do this, whether it's going to zoom in for you or not, but if we just hover over the image, it's actually 100 by 100 pixels. But if I, just for fun, do a copy image address, we will see that the image itself is really massive. And I'm just shrinking this down. Uh, so I'm shrinking the 2,000 by 3,200 pixel image to just 100 and 100. But I still need to download it. Now, these are all very best strategies. So what can you do? There are a bunch of things that you can do here. First of all, you could, for example, um, as part of your build process, generate uh, you know, smaller images. So run uh, your images through things like, um, uh, what's that tool called? Um, where there's Jim, uh, there's... And I'm forgetting the name of the tool, but basically there's this tool that allows you to sort of, you know, grab all your JPEGs uh, uh, programmatically and then just say, reduce the size, reduce the quality, and then it will output, uh, you know, those optimized uh, JPEGs. Uh, and I'm just blanking on the name of the tool. So that's already a good thing, because now at least you, you would have, you know, smaller sized images they would be somewhat optimized, and therefore it would help with your overall performance. Or even better, what you could do, you could use a third-party tool to and allow them to do all this optimization for you. So I'm going to do a quick demo for you, and then I'm going to carry on discussing this media aspect of this um, uh, project as well. So let's assume that we have this image. Okay, this is an image of, of, this, uh, of this lady. And what I've done, I've taken this image and I uploaded it to Cloudinary. So Cloudinary, for those of you who don't know, is a cloud-based image video uh, solution that allows you to store, transform, optimize, and deliver your images and videos. So I uploaded this image to Cloudinary, and I get an access URL that looks like this, rest.cloudinary.com forward slash my username, image upload woman.jpg. And if I open my network tab, we can see that this particular image is about 583 kilobytes in size, and it is a JPEG, which is its extension. But what if I want to make sure that I, I want to optimize this image, right? Now, again, I don't have time to get into the details, but there's lots of image formats. There's JPEG, WebP, uh, JP2000, which is a type of JPEG, PNG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Chrome actually says, you know what? I can work with the WebP image format the best. So if you serve me a WebP image format, which is a, a better optimized image format than JPEG, the size is going to be reduced. Now, Safari says, well, if you send me a WebP, I have no idea what a WebP is. You could send me a JPEG. Also, if you could send me a JPEG 2000 encoded JPEG, that would be the best. So now you have two different browsers with two different image formats. You would now have to create those and somehow programmatically figure out a way to serve the right image format for the right browser. That's a lot of work. 
In Cloudinary, what we can do is just add f underscore auto to the URL, which is automatic format. And Cloudinary on the server side is going to generate the appropriate image format based on the browser that you're using to open up the image. So I'm going to hit enter. First thing to notice, from 583 kilobytes, it went down to 50 kilobytes. That's a massive reduction. Why did that happen? If I open up the response headers, I am now seeing a WebP image. So Cloudinary is actually serving a WebP image for us. If I take exactly the same URL, and if I open a new Safari window, and I bring this over here, and I open the image in Safari, and I open up the network panel in Safari, and I zoom in on the network panel in Safari, and do a refresh. And if I take a look at the headers, the same URL presents an image slash JP2, which is JPEG 2000, which is the best encoding for JPEG for Safari. That's pretty much it. That was easy, right? But we can do a lot more. So let's say this is a profile image. First of all, we can do a Q underscore auto as a sort of second parameter, which is automatic quality. So using the CLI tools for image optimization, you can say, I have a JPEG, create a quality 75 of that JPEG. But that's going to do that 75 quality for all of your images, regardless of its content. In Cloudinary with Q auto, it will first analyze the image and it will decide how much optimization to add to the image without a visual impairment. In, in, in other terms, you will not, I'm sorry, visual uh, fidelity. So without losing quality, essentially, right? So it's not going to be visible to the human eye. So if I do Q auto, it reduces the quality, but it's not visible to the human eye, but we went to 32 kilobytes in size. Okay, so furthermore, I need to switch gears again, I'm sorry. So I can create that 100 by 100 pixel image. So I can say 100 high, 100 width, which is going to create this kind of skewed image, but now we have 1.8 kilobytes. But we want to say, you know what? Actually crawl a thumbnail from this and automatically find a face and put that into the center. And if I do that, it did, yeah, that's a comma, the dot. If I do this, now I have this 100 by 100 pixel profile image, which is 1.8 kilobytes, which is much better than what I had here, which is shrinking down uh, that to uh, reducing CSS. So I think I need to wrap up soonish. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong window. Um, I have 10 minutes. So in these 10 minutes, I'm just going to show you the final application and show you what I've done there using code. Because that's how you will learn. So first of all, I, I kind of showed you the Angular specific things. Additional things that I've done was to preload uh, the fonts that I'm using. The reason why I'm preloading the fonts is because on a very, very slow device, um, so if I open the app here, this is the incorrect app. So if I go to the network tab, under the network tab, you can sort of mimic speeds. So on the fast 3G connection, if I refresh this page, uh, is it not running? If I refresh this page on a fast 3G connection, there could be situations when the text appears or nothing appears, and the page of bliss, I, I don't know if you, if you were able to see that, and the fonts then get applied, right? So if I do this again, pay attention to this line here, you will see some text, and then it's going to sort of refresh using the fonts that I specified. Hopefully you, you managed to see that. It's not that obvious, but it's happening. By doing a preload of the fonts, you're basically telling the browser, hey, go ahead and download this font with a priority. And when the page loads, it will not sort of change the font face because the font is already downloaded. So the browser will be able to, to render that for you. Um, on the article component, what I've done, I've done a lot of things. <laughs> I have basically 
um, article component. I basically replaced the images with, with cloud images. That was one thing that I've done. The second thing that I created a Caruso component. And inside the Caruso component, I'm applying lazy loading to the images. So basically, I've uploaded all these images to Cloudinary, and then I use the Cloudinary Angular SDK with the loading lazy attribute or, or property or, or you know, call it whatever you want it, so that only the images that are in my viewport get loaded in that carousel. And when everything else is loaded, and I kind of start scrolling in that carousel, additional images will be loaded. I can very simply demonstrate this for you. So if you go back to this network panel, and if we do uh, WP star, this, this is the name of the images. So I'm going to refresh. All right, no. images. I'm going to start and mess this up. But let's let's start this again. WP refresh. So what I'm going to see is, of course, I will have one, two. It's image one, two, three, and four get loaded because these are the ones that I can kind of see. And as if I keep on scrolling, we should notice that image five. Six and seven get loaded only when they are visible in the viewport. Okay, so that's sort of classic uh, lazy loading here, enabled by this particular property. And I'm also doing something else here. I'm also sort of reducing the width of the images to be 250 on the server side. So by default, comparing the image sizes here, I'm just downloading images that are 72. 53, 63 kilobytes in size, as opposed to the base application, if you remember, where I was downloading images that were a couple of megabytes each. Okay, so that, of course, is also going to help. Furthermore, one more sort of optimization thing that I added here is this DPR auto, which is device pixel ratio. It tells Cloudinary that if you're on a retina screen, download a larger image. If you're on a non-retina screen, just download you know, the one-time pixel uh, image. So basically, on the MacBook, it's actually downloading a 500 pixel image, dense to be uh, only 215 size. What else have I done? Well, I have also um, back to the articles component. I've basically also replaced the GIF with an MP4 file, right? Because you can actually make uh, a video element act like a GIF by adding the autoplay muted and loop attributes to it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the page here, uh, this is the right one. If you look at the page here, you will see that this video plays exactly the same way that you saw it before. So there is no way that you can tell this is a GIF or a video, right? And it's just going to uh, keep on playing just like any other GIF. But because this is an MP4 file, it is definitely not 18 megabytes in size, but only a couple of megabytes. Okay, still, of course, it's a video, so it's still going to take up uh, quite a few uh, megabytes. So I think these were the sort of major things that, that I've done um, in terms of you know, Angular, in terms of the visuals, in terms of you know, eliminating uh, codes uh, or modules that I'm not using. And now, if I, the one thing that I'm going to do is. Uh, in the articles component, I'm just going to remove this Fibonacci line so that we get some faster uh, reloads. I'm going to build this application. And we're going to take a look at two more things, um, and then I will be uh, wrapping up. So while this build is happening, notice this thing that I added here. There's this new, well, old new. Um, Web API called the, I think the official name is the Network Information API. The Network Information API gets wider support these days, but I think that the best support is in, is in Chrome. And what it tells you is the connection that a particular uh, user is using. And it has potential values of slow dash 2G, 2G, 3G, and 4G. So basically, what I'm saying here is that if someone is using the network information API, 
then I act as the effective pipe, and if it's slow 2G, 2G, or 3G, I say fast connection is false, otherwise I default to a fast connection of true. Why am I doing this? Because in the article's components, I say if the user has a fast connection, then play them a video. If they do not have a fast connection, instead, I'm just taking a screenshot from the video and still provide them a heavily optimized um, visual content by right, using F auto and Q auto. So this is what I meant by I'm still taking the the user's sort of you know, network and device into consideration, but I am still providing them visual content. So if you take a look at this now, so the yes. Here, localhost 8080. What we're getting now is a, a very fast site, heavily optimized. And if I just, you know, just for fun, change to a 3G connection, even on a 3G connection, I'm going to get a page load that is relatively quick. You see, it's, it's very quick. I still have visual content, but now I just have an image. Okay, everything else loads exactly the same. So I'm not using up the the speed, the you know the, uh, the potential uh, uh, bandwidth of the user because they're on 3G. It would be fast. There's a reason why they're on a 3G connection. They may have a limited uh, data plan and so on and so forth. There are strategies that you can follow to to make sure that you know if, if the browser is not having the network information API, you can still have some solutions where. If the, the device width is like an iPad or like a tablet or smaller than a screen, you can still utilize, uh, you know, just showing an image instead of a video. And let me do one more thing here, which is, you know, this is the MP4 file, the URL to the MP4 file. And, you know, how can I get a JPEG out of this? Well, in Cloudinary, this is a Cloudinary URL for a video, you just replace this with JPEG. And what I'm going to get now is just a JPEG file, which is amazing. Okay, one more tool that I want you to be uh, aware of. Again, this is part of Chrome DevTools. You can select these three dots, you can go to more tools, and the tool is called Coverage. Coverage is then going to go through all of your uh, Wait, wait, is this what am I is the coverage? Should be coverage. Oh, click the real button. Okay, so this is going to go through all your CSS and JavaScript files and show you how much of the JavaScript code is being used or not being used, right? And it's going to basically open up the file and anywhere that you see red, that is the lines are not actually being used. Be very careful with this, because this is relevant to this page. Now, your bundle may contain something that you use on other pages, you know, some other styles that you use on other page. Make sure that you use this tool with caution, OK? It helps you, but it can also cause some, some headaches for you. OK, and last but not least, we're going to go to Lighthouse. And let's go and generate a report. And let's see if we have enabled uh, better web performance for our particular application. And we now have a performance of 96. Best practices went down. There's a reason for that. Uh, um, image encoding, next gen format. Again, that's another topic. But essentially, we have fixed the web performance issue um, by applying these sort of changes. And going back to my presentation to wrap up. So there are lots of tools to help you to measure speeds, you know, page size, media speeds, speed test, impact calculator, et cetera, et cetera. These are all links. You have access to these uh, via the presentation. The two bottom links are to GitHub, the two repositories, the slow app and the fast app. So you can take a look at those, compare them. Uh, essentially, it's the same code base that you've seen uh, throughout this presentation. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I enjoyed delivering this to you. 
Um, this was the last talk, I guess. So uh, thank you very much for, for sticking around. Um, if you have any questions, as I said, you can access, uh, you can contact me via Twitter, and my Twitter handle is on this page, which I can't find now. Uh, it's on the first page on the top here. Let me just bring it up. There it is. And again, thank you very much.